have to have curiosity. Yeah. Somebody tells you something, do it this way, why? And then they say, because of this one, you say, why? And then just keep asking. Todd, thank you so much for chatting with me today. I'm so excited to talk to you. You are the perfect guest for this podcast, I have to tell you. If it were just a podcast and not video, then maybe I'd have a voice for it. <laughs> you, have, you have the perfect voice, but not the perfect face? I disagree. Right. I disagree. Okay. So I always like to start each podcast with a quote. And so I'm going to share this quote with you. And then I would just love to hear your feedback on what you hear. Okay. So here it goes. Failure with clay was more complete and more spectacular than with any other forms of art. You are subject to the elements. Any one of the old four, earth, air, fire, water, can betray you and melt or burst or shatter months of work into dust and ashes and spitting steam. You need to be a precise scientist. You need to know how to play with what chance will do to your lovingly constructed surfaces in the heat of the kiln. And that comes from A.S. Byant in the book, The Children's Book. Does that evoke any thoughts for you? Well, did you pick that for me? I did. did you, okay. Well, that was kind of interesting because you probably know I'm a potter. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so you connected that dot. <laughs> but that was so interesting that you're a potter. And I was thinking about um, your business and how that might relate in some regard. So what, what are your thoughts on that, though? Well, so first of all, being a potter is really my, I'll call it my Zen space. So when I'm in my studio, I'm checked out. I mean, the world could come to an end and I wouldn't know it um, because I'm just kind of, that's the only time that I'm truly just single-minded and thinking of doing one thing and my mind does not wander. So let's just kind of set that aside. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I just love, you know, I say in uh, with ceramics, what's unique about it, what I love about it, is there's kind of three phases to it. There's the craft, there's the art, and there's the science. And they're all very different. You know, in order to be a great ceramicist, you have to be great in all three. It's like in order to be a great golfer, you got to be able to drive, hit your irons, putt, chip. You have to have it all great. I am not great at any of them. I'm good at some and I'm fair at others, um, you know, but that's okay because uh, it's fun and you can create and make mistakes. And, you know, you put something in the kiln that comes out, looks like crap and you throw it away. You know, you throw something on the wheel and, and it doesn't work and you smush it and throw it in the bucket and you recycle the clay and you do it again. So, you know, it's part of the whole creative and building process, which I which I love between the, the science, the craft and the art um, all together. And in That's some ways, do you see any sort of correlation to the business that you're in by chance? Well, I, I, I mean... It um, accidentally, yes, you know, I mean, it kind of goes yeah. back to when I was a kid, you know, when all I wanted for birthday parties and stuff like that was, you know, was Lego or pieces of wood. <laughs> so my, my my father used to say that I was, the, it was the easiest thing in the world for him to get me presents because he would literally go to the local lumber, lumber yard. He would go back to the lumber yard and they have like a barrel of scrap. So when people would say, hey, I need a piece of this. And he'd say, can I have some scrap? And they'd give it to him. And he didn't pay for it. It's scrap <laughs> lumber. And then they'd wrap it in wrapping paper, you know, and I'd open it up and I'd be excited that I got the wood <laughs> that I could nail together or something like that. It's so <laughs> great. It's so great. Dude, they, get away, they got away with it. I mean, could you imagine today? Totally. No, yeah, like, for sure. Today, what the hell is this? A pile of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that doesn't fly these days. Oh yeah. No, yeah how no. do you plug? Where's the battery for? How do you plug it in? Where's the screen? Yeah. So it is so great that you you went back to your childhood for a minute because yeah. you, you have a great story of your first business. So, you know, please share. Like, how? What was your first business? What did you start doing? Well, business or how I made money. There. Okay. Go All either right. way. I think they're both going to be great <laughs> stories. Well, that, I mean, the simple one is when I was in middle school. There was a there was a, um, a candy store that opened up called Sydney Bog. Probably heard of Sydney Bog, but it was a big deal, and everyone knows them today. They were the Red Hot Fireballs, okay? Yeah. And they were like the hot thing, and that was like seventh or eighth grade. Everyone thought they were the coolest things. Like, yeah, they were great, but it's like no big deal. You got to go to the store and buy them. So I would go and buy a big, you know, 
I don't know, a hundred of them or whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever they, whatever they were, a hundred of them for $2. And I'd bring them to school and sell them for a quarter a piece. It was <laughs> the, the margins were unbelievable. <laughs> so great. Right. <laughs> It, was, it wasn't big dollars, but the margins were the margins, Right. You don't see margins like that so often. Maybe with, software. Unless you saw them popcorn at a, you know, at a, uh, at a movie theater. It's the only, the only place you got margins like that. Yeah. Uh, so anyhow, uh, but no, so then and when I was 16, um, uh, so actually my brother had some window washing clients. He's two years older than me. So I took that over and then I started a window washing company. Me and a buddy of mine, uh, a friend of mine in high school, his name was Doug. And we came back a very creative name it was called Doug and Todd's window washing. <laughs> <laughs> so right? lesson lesson number one, don't obsess over the name. <laughs> don't obsess over the name, right? It's simple. That you're not gonna win because of the name, right? <laughs> so yeah, it was a window washing company. And what we what we what most of our clients were retail stores. We just washed the windows at retail stores. So you know, right. so, you know I we look like I go to strip centers and I'd walk in and say, Hello, where's the manager? Blah, blah, blah. Hey, I'll wash your windows for you know five dollars a side. You know, every other week we'll be here. So it'll be fifteen dollars a month. Two we call it two out, one in. Outside twice a month, inside once a month, fifteen dollar a month, piece of cake. You know, so um kind of did that through high school and then spanned it through college. Um, and then my junior year of college started a maid service. Um, that's a whole nother funny story. I'll give you the very short story because I don't okay. want to kill all, all that. Is the original idea with me and um, a couple of my buddies was there was going to be a student maid service. Okay. Right. So we get on the phone and we're calling students. Say, hey, how much would you pay to clean your have your apartment clean? You know, nothing. You know, five dollars. <laughs> right. You know, right. <laughs> the idea the idea didn't go very far. But we said, hey, okay, we think actually real people might want their house clean. <laughs> <laughs> so we started maid service and learned pretty quickly that uh, real people, non-students that live in Ann Arbor, um, uh, want, and so we started maid service and uh, kind of grew that through through college and expanded that. But one other funny, the, the funniest story of all about that one was, and again, it's going to show you how how stupid you can be, right? So <laughs> we we said, okay, how do we kick this thing off? We're going to put an ad in the Ann Arbor News, okay? And so we counted the Ann Arbor News. I got to make this quick. And the circulation was 52,000 people, okay, or 52,000 homes, right? So we're thinking, oh my God, that's a lot, right? So we did the math and we said, okay, if 52,000 homes get it, and if 10% of the people actually see our ad, that's 5,000, right? And then if 10% of those people actually call, that's five, oh my God, we're going to get 500 phone calls. Okay. So, so we said, okay, well, we, we got, so what we did is we said, all right, we have to schedule. So if between eight and five, somebody has to be here to answer the phone. So we looked at our class schedule. Okay. You're on the phones from, you know, eight to 10. Okay. I got a class at 11. So literally for like two weeks, we, we like we're on phone duty. Okay. I think two people called. Two weeks. <laughs> so great it's classic it's classic the 10 percent and the, just the numbers 10 percent and then 10 percent right yeah. so it's really, we're asking for one percent of the people to call <laughs> that's so great and by the way no not to age you but i think we're similar in age at 54 and uh i had no cell phones back then really oh this was this was 1980 80 Three. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No cell phones. So now, now you did mention one thing though, that I always like to ask because, you know, we talk about, should we go to college? Should we not go to college? Mm -hmm. So talk about your college experience. Did you feel like, and you went to university of Michigan, was that a good experience? If you look back, are you glad you went? Do you feel like I didn't need it really? I could have just jumped right into business. So, um, well, first of all, I had a phenomenal experience. I was actually pre-med. Um, so <laughs> I went all the way through pre-med, took the MCATs, got into medical school, and decided to want to go, which is a another story. But again, we can't get too many stories here. Um, but stories well, are good. You, you, you know what I, you know what I tell people is that if you have the ability, the resources, and the commitment to go to college uh, and get a four-year degree. What you learn the most is how to learn. So I'm going to say it again. You learn how you learn. Because in any business that you're in, I don't care, you're an entrepreneur or otherwise, 
you have to be a lifelong learner because things are constantly changing. And if you're not a lifelong learner and you haven't learned how to learn. So one of the greatest skills that I think I learned in college in my four years is how do I learn? So when new things come up, whether it be technology or whatever it may be, I know how I learn. I've, I've learned the skill of learning. And I don't think you'll really learn much of that skill in high school. Maybe some people do. I think it really becomes refined in college because you're so independent and you got to figure it out. It's not spoon fed to you anymore. So you got to figure out how do I learn? If I'm going to survive, I got to learn how to learn. Yeah. So I guess, well, you know, whether you're a poli sci major or a, well, I did biochem, I taught biochem in college, you know, I, I, that's the skill that I learned is my, in the fact that I learned uh, RNA synthesis in the Krebs cycle, is that, you know, is that helping me in business today? Of course not. Right. You know? But, right. but it's how the whole learn. learning how to learn. That's yeah. my. Yeah, that's great. And then when you came out, what was the first real business that you started? Well, I still had the maid service in the window washing company. You did. Yeah. So, so that's kind of what it was is I graduated and I said, okay, am I going to medical school or am I going to wash windows and clean toilets? I mean, that really was the decision. Yeah. <laughs> I chose to, and I chose to wash windows and clean toilets instead of going to med school. And then um, how did that business evolve? Um, you know, I had a, uh, so I had a, the window washing business was kind of, um, kind of Southeastern Michigan because it was routes. The mm -hmm. maid service at that time was only in Ann Arbor. So right when I graduated, I expanded the maid service to Farmington Hills, which is a suburb of Detroit. Yeah. And so I had an office in Ann Arbor, an office in Farmington Hills, and we had the window washing company in Ann Arbor and, uh, and in Farmington Hills. So so we had, like I had two offices. Um, actually, the one in, in Ann Arbor start, was in my house, okay? In college, it was out of, the, out of our apartment. And then when I graduated, I ran a house. It was in the house, and then eventually got an office. The Farmington Hills was was an office that I had, that I had rented. So mm -hmm. yeah, so was that was basically that. I mean, when I graduated, I had God. There was probably uh, I think maybe a half a dozen like housekeepers that worked for us, and I think I had four window washers, and I was washing windows too. So. <laughs> Um, I was doing a lot of the window washing myself and I was cleaning a lot of houses when, you know, Stacy didn't show up. <laughs> I was, you know, trust you right me, I cleaned more toilets and more kitchen floors than most people. That's right. That's called working hard, really hard, which is one of our must do's. Yes. Yeah. Right. And then, yeah. so did, did you, did that business evolve into the business that you're in now, or did you get out of that business and start the business? T tell the story around that. So, um, so that, so I just kind of get the dates. So I graduated college in 85. And um, so I had the, had those businesses. Um, I started buying student rental properties in Ann Arbor, houses and student rental properties. Um, and I was the maintenance guy and I was the leasing person. And, you know, so, you know, and when I, when, you know, when the, you know, doorknob fell off, I'd go there with my Jeep and I'd fix it. And I'd hang out with the students because I was 23 and they were 21 or 20. Now I'd have a beer and fix their, fix their doorknob. Right. <laughs> um, uh, so, so that was going on. So I had that, I had the, you know, the, the maid service, the window washing company. And then four years later, so 1989. So what I was 26, um, had an opportunity to buy some land in Ann Arbor uh, with some other guys and build a hundred unit apartment complex. And I had, absolutely know what I was doing. No clue. But you know, when you're 26 years old, and you're doing you just say, I just say yes, I did. sure. Okay, yeah, we'll do it. Right? I'll figure it out. So I was one only one in Ann Arbor. And so I hired the architect and I kind of became the local on site guy, end up hiring a superintendent to run the construction project. And I basically became his assistant superintendent. Okay, I was like, I was his bitch on the job site. Okay, <laughs> for 14 months. Um, so I had that going, I had the office in Farmington Hills, I had the office in Ann Arbor, the window washing, I had all going on, working 120 hours a week, seven days a week, six in the morning till midnight, every single day. Yeah. Um, but loving it. I mean, I, and I loved being on the job site. I mean, I had so much fun. I mean, it was really, I mean, I get, I'm going to get back a lot of stories. Um, so that was. So that project was done in 91, beginning in 91. 
And I just said, you know, this is, I love this. So I sold my cleaning company. So I sold the Ann Arbor window washing and maid service operation to one guy. I sold the Farmington Hills window washing to a different guy. So two different people bought each one of those. And I said, I'm going to start a construction company. And here's where I got creative again. The name, Saxy Construction. <laughs> You went to the last name this time. This time it wasn't Todd. I figured I had to. I figured I had to get a little more sophisticated. Todd's construction just wasn't going to cut that it. Was a little bit right, right. <laughs> right? Um, and I, uh, yeah, I rented a ten foot by ten foot office in somebody else's office. Put an ad in the in the in the yellow pages. Your, your listeners probably don't know what that is. Most probably don't. Right, right. Um, and um, started calling everybody I knew. This is hey, let me try to build you something. Amazing. Amazing. And, you know, as any entrepreneur is going along in this journey, that you already mentioned some great stories, but I always like to ask, what was the nightmare story? And I'm sure there's more than one, but does one pop into your mind, you know, the story of the nightmare? So it's funny you say that. It's it, when I look back at them, there's so little, but in the moment, it was such a big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know that sounds crazy, no, but, but I'm going to give you, a, I'll just tell you one that kind of like, literally it was probably nine months, maybe a year into the construction company. Okay. And it basically, it was me in the office and I had a bookkeeper person. Her name was Robert, Roberta, Robert, I forgot. Okay. Um, and, and that was it. Okay. And I'm running around again, like, you know, working like crazy and she quit okay and i freaked out i literally like oh my god i i don't have time to bid the jobs run the jobs yeah. pay the bills da, 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 da. i mean i remember it's funny you say that i remember that and going oh my god and i remember talking to a friend of mine at that time and his name was danny and i was telling him and he looked at me he goes todd and by the way, he's a doctor. He said, Todd, you will survive it and be better off for it. Okay. I'll never <laughs> forget advice. that. Right. He just said that. All these and years I, later, you remember this. I remember that. Great, right. Yeah. And by the way, of course he was right. That's right. That's, that's right. Okay. Right. So let's go to but the other hundreds of other ones too, but I'm sure. Yeah. And many are going to come out as we keep talking, but what was the dream for you? What was the story of the dream? What was one thing where you were like, wow, this is unbelievable. So, I mean, to be perfectly frank, when I started the, the, the um, construction company, mm -hmm. my goal was if I could make a thousand dollars a week, <laughs> I'd be the happiest person in the world. I love it. That was it. Like the thought of being able to have literally 52 weeks a year mm -hmm. to make a thousand dollars a week mm -hmm. that I, I've made it. That's amazing. Like and that was my, that was literally, that was my financial goal. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I finally had a financial goal, but you know, I just was figuring out I was going along. And you're a humble person. I know, but I, you know, just for the listeners, your, your company is huge now. I mean, how many team members do you have at Saxy? So there's five companies now, um, and the whole we call it the enterprise of companies. There's five companies, and there's about 350 team members okay. across the five companies. So think about that. <laughs> From Todd to 350, if you're listening, you know, and you can feel the passion to this day coming through the audio and the video for how you feel about this business. It's truly amazing. Is is there one thing that you wish you knew in the early stages as you think back? You know, if I just knew that, it would have been so helpful. So I wouldn't say no, but I because I didn't know anything then and I don't know much loud because one of my favorite proverbs is the more I learn, the more I realize how little I knew. Mm -hmm. Because the more you learn, you go, I was so dumb. I didn't know I didn't know that. So as you, get, <laughs> as you learn more, you actually realize that you get dumber every day because you realize that you didn't know anything, right? Um, you know, but one thing that I would say that I didn't really learn uh, until later, and I tell young people this all the time, which is the value of relationships, okay? So I was so much of a head down through college, you know, pre-med, work, do my thing. I was a workaholic getting the job done, servicing work service. And I didn't 
I didn't focus on expanding relationships. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. Um, my whole thing was I'll just, I just, I'll, I can outwork anybody. I'll win by just outworking. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. You know, so, uh, and it wasn't until later, probably I would, I'm going to give you my guess, probably until I was in my mid thirties mm-hmm. until I realized that relationships mm-hmm. are really, really important. Mm-hmm. Um, and had I known that earlier, I think it would have benefited me in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's great. I always, I always like to ask about mentorship and I, I have another quote and it, it, it's from you. You said, if you are fortunate enough to find mentors who are older, experienced and you respect, that's wonderful. Recognize very early on that you are the dumbest one in the room, not the smartest one in the room. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm building a little bit after off of your last, um, uh, what you just said a moment ago, you know, did you have mentors you know, how useful were they? What do you, do you encourage finding a mentor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I'm the luckiest person in the world (laughs) because I didn't have a mentor. Okay. I effectively had four. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, mean real mentors. Okay. Mm -hmm, One mm -hmm. of them has passed away and one of them, you know, quite well, which is Gino. Mm -hmm. I consider him one of my mentors and Mm -hmm. thank God he came into my life. He's been a wonderful person. Mm -hmm. I had three other gentlemen that I had met, um, you know, first one I met right after college when I was 22 years old, who to this day, um, his name is Neil, who um, I has been like just a wonderful person. He's helped me along the way. And you know, I said another story. That he and then he introduced me another gentleman whose name is Ron, um, who's like it was 88 years old now, and who being a mentor to this day. Um, and then another gentleman whose name was Bob, who since passed away, uh, who was actually a, fa- a friend of my father's. Um, my father passed away when I was in college. Mm-hmm. He was a friend, a family friend, who was a mentor also. So you know, these were just these these men in my life that. You know, I would go to and ask questions and they would ask me questions and, you know, and it wasn't just, it wasn't just only about business and a lot of it just about life and how you approach things and what's important and priorities and challenging me. And, you know, so I was just so lucky to have that. Yeah. Did you seek them out or no. did you, so, okay. Did it was, was it, it happened. It just happened, but you were paying attention. And then how did you cultivate the relationships? You know, that's, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't know if I were to think back on it, it's probably just being responsive and, you yeah. know, and being humble and saying, Hey, Neil, I'm looking at saying, what do you think? Oh my, I totally screwed this up. You know, what, <laughs> yes. what, what do you think? Or, um, and then what's really fortunate, I mean, particularly Ron, uh, is one of the gentlemen who, uh, who helped me with the apartment complex? I told you that yeah. they built. Um, he he actually took me under his wing. He mm. actually, you know, really it was probably way him more than me. Interesting. Okay? Yeah, he would call me a ton of times and just check in with me and what's going on and how you doing and what about this and what about that? What's happening here? What's happening there? So he he was more proactive with me Mm -hmm. um, almost like a surrogate father that he you know so that was very blessed Mm. that he did that so as i say i'm just lucky that that all happened you know that's very Mm -hmm. serendipitous you know and so i mentioned earlier must these must do's that we talk about and one of them is get feedback from customers and clients early and often Mm -hmm. and you say at saxy we thrive on feedback to this day. And one of the things I noticed when I was doing some preparation for this is 350 employees, your email is right where your profile is on the uh, website and you're inviting people to contact you, customers, clients, et cetera, whoever else, maybe perspective. And and myself. And And myself. Oh, I didn't even see that. Okay, I didn't notice. I overlooked that. So talk about the importance of this. Yeah. Well, so we say we actually, Erica, we have five obsessions. Okay. And it's funny you mentioned that one of them is feedback. And we tell everybody we're obsessed 
with feedback, obsessed with it. And it's not just from your customers. So we say, who is your customer? Everybody's your customer. Your team members, your customer, your vendors, your customer, your customers, your customer. If you're not begging for feedback, like asking for it in a true, sincere, humble way, how do you know what's going on? You know, you think about it. You know, I like to do sports analogies. You know, if a basketball player or a football player, all they do out there at practice all day long and no one is telling them to improve or giving them feedback, is this better, that better? Well, they're never <laughs> going to improve. How, what, they're just going to be doing the same thing over and over again. And it, it kind of surprises me that, think about it, anybody who's great at what they do, they got great at it because they were coached, they were supported, you know, somehow that happened. Yeah, It came from other people. So if you don't open up your world and your mind for that feedback, and and it it actually goes back to one of our core values that everyone in our organization, which is, you know, strive for excellence by constantly raising the bar. That's one of our core values. What that really means is if you're not somebody who wants to raise the bar and get better and better and better, well, then you can't be part of our organization. Mm -hmm. So it's that same concept. And if you don't have that, you know, you're not, you don't want feedback if you don't want to get better. Right. You, you want to get better at something, you want feedback. And you also feedback. said at some point, ask more questions and do a lot more listening. The old saying is, I never learned anything while I was talking. Right. And so you said you learned that at an early age. Yes. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. I, yes. And I love that because I, I tell people that all the time. Um, but the other thing I say, there's, there's one word in the English language is the most important word, which is the word why. Mm. Right, you have mm-hmm. to have curiosity. Yeah, so if somebody tells you something, do it this way. Why? And then mm-hmm. they say because of this, and you say why? Mm-hmm. And then just keep asking why, because that's how you learn and grow. If you just ask why, I learned. I really learned that from uh, from Neil, one of my mentors. The mentors. Every time I would ask him a question, he would never answer it. <laughs> he would ask. He would turn it into a question back to me. That's good. Good. Okay. That's a good it, mentor. It used to drive me crazy. Sure. I mean, I say, Neil, just tell me what you think. <laughs> right? And he would never to this day, right? He just he would ask uh-huh. me, you know. That's right? great. Yeah. You know, there's different stages our businesses go through over time. And <clears throat> one of the things that we talk about is generating cash as early as as early as possible. And I was thinking about you know, your business and how cash flow works, especially in the early days. So, you know, can you share your insights on how that was for you and how you were able to manage and generate cash? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really hard at the beginning. So, yeah, <laughs> Thank you, you for you, that. Yeah, you have to, first of all, you have to, if you're starting from nothing and you're not, you know, I say, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, a member of the Lucky Sperm Club, um, <laughs> okay, where, you know, you're, you don't have to work or whatever, mm, yeah. um, which I was not in that position. You have to be prepared to live very poor. You 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 have to be prepared to be poor, okay? Yeah. Um, and and do that. I mean, it's just that's just part of it. It really it really and truly is. Um, you got to be like, like living on the skin of your teeth there, kind of a thing. Yeah. So. You know, when I started the construction company, I was just like exactly what it was. I literally um, was fortunate enough to borrow some twenty five thousand dollars from the bank. I got a twenty five thousand dollar bank line. Um, I think in sixty days it was up to twenty five thousand dollars. Okay, and <laughs> um, you know, I, I I think it was nineteen months before I took even a, a call to paycheck any money. Right. Okay. I mean. You know, I don't know. I can't tell you what it was. I'd be making it up if I did. You know, my guess it was hundreds of dollars uh, at the time. Uh, but you know, literally, I mean, I was effectively working for free uh, for that period of time, and to build what you got to build, you have to, you have to, you have to sacrifice. You mm-hmm. absolutely, unless, I mean, I didn't have investors. I mean, my my business all was organic different some entrepreneurs to start they'll have investors to, to capitalize a business and i and i will tell you that in my opinion as you grow if you if you don't capitalize your business if you don't build a balance seat you cannot grow and it's unsustainable and you cannot scale so you must build a balance sheet mm-hmm. which means you'd have to be be very very disciplined 
and sacrifice for a lot longer than you want to, because otherwise all you're going to do is build yourself a job and not a business. Yeah. Which is so, a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, I know we could go off on a whole, yeah. that's a whole yeah. other episode actually. No, but another episode. Yeah. Please take what Todd is saying to heart. <laughs> um, and if you don't know what a balance sheet is, by the way, that is not uncommon. And I just will encourage you right now to just begin to become financially literate. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that will serve you well in the long term, I promise. Um, now, one of the things I, as I was do, again doing some um, uh, research, uh, I was think one of the things we talk about is staying in your personal sweet spot. And I noticed that I think it was back in 93, according to what I have on my notes, you ventured out to California and did a job out in Universal uh, City and even went out and did a hotel about 10, uh, nine or 10 years after that. And I thought to myself, you know, how, how does that play into your personal sweet spot, especially as a company? You know, you, you mentioned you were in the Detroit, Michigan, Ann Arbor area, um, it, but here you were out in California, you know, doing that, or you went from doing other kinds of things like apartments to a hotel. Yeah. So can you talk a little about a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it comes down to one word or two words. It's risk and confidence, uh -huh. <laughs> right? You yeah. know, so, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you got to be willing to take risk and you have to have confidence that somehow you're going to figure it out. And I'll admit, in most of those cases, going into it, I didn't necessarily have any idea how I was going to do it, you know. Um, but my confidence, whether it be in myself or other people that I had working with me, is that we're going to figure it out. You know, we're going to, as I said, whether it be outwork at the other people or we're going to dig deep and yeah. um, we're going to ask a lot of questions. And, you know, uh, I'll never forget which kind of kind of this, this will, I think, tie to it is remember one of my early team members. His name is Jeff, who to this now he's one of my partners, actually, with me for over 25 years, Amazing. Um, very early in our career. And he came in. He said, I don't know anything about the electrical. I don't know anything about plumbing. You know, what do I do? I said, ask the electrician. Just you see some of the drawings, you know what it is, electrical, just pick up the phone and call Sparky and say, hey, I'm looking at this thing and I'm looking at sheet E5. Could you explain that to me? You know, just be humble and ask the people who are experts. So, you know, some people think that you you can't, you should think you should know everything. It's the exact opposite. Okay. Just ask. So I give a lot of presentations and training and I, um, yeah. They kind of say, I don't know, this may be politically incorrect, but I really don't care. I'd say there's something about on the Y chromosome that, which men have, by the way, those uh, of you that took uh, genetics, we have Y chromosomes, um, <laughs> women don't. On the Y chromosome, somewhere it says that you're not allowed to say, I don't know. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's somewhere in that thing, <laughs> right? If you don't have a Y chromosome, you're allowed to say that, right? So I tell, particularly our men, I say, it's okay to say, I don't know. Well, mm -hmm. Let me find out. That's right? great. Right. Mm -hmm. So just having that, just just do your homework, ask other questions and dig yeah. deep. And that's what it comes down great. to. And you know, I wanted to end with this because your culture is you're an award, you have an award-winning culture and your core values are so clear. And you know, this is another one of the key components that we talk about. And so when did you incorporate core values and how have they played out for you all? Right. So first of all, one thing as I, you probably know quite well in the whole EOS program and stuff like that is we did not decide what our core values were. We discovered our core values. Okay. Yes. Um, I use the analogy that, you know, Einstein did not, you know, um, you know, this, you know, design the, theory of relativity, he discovered it, okay? We discovered our core values, what they already are. He said to find out what they were. Um, and that was in 2003, through a process we did with Gino, Gino Wickman, who kind of introduced us the concept and it was a whole a whole day session we went through as I'm, I'm sure you and hopefully some of your, your listeners are aware of. Um, and to this day, we established those in 2003, our four core values, and that one word has changed in 20 years. It is exactly the same. We've never, you know, in every quarter, we review it and we ask ourselves, I would do it. Do we hire and fire? Do we live this and breathe this every day? 
And is our team members breathing it every single day? And if the answer has got to be yes. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, uh, it's biblical. And so at what stage would you see an entrepreneur, a kind of an earlier stage business, when's a good time to discover your core values? Um, that's a great question. I don't think I know the answer, but I'll tell you what I think the answer might be, is that you have to have an, enough um, critical mass of people, right? It doesn't have to be 50 people, maybe it's 10, maybe it's five, maybe it's 20, mm-hmm. and that you can have enough to see kind of, what are you attracting? What 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 is your world? And if it feels right, and can you say, all right, these five people that are here at this company really exemplify who we are, not what we do. Not, I always say, it's nothing to do with the what. You know, what you do, you might be, you know, whatever consultants for building bridges, okay? Well, that's what you do. It's irrelevant what you do. It's the who. So these five people really exemplify who we are. I relate to them as the, you know, principal or founder or whatever you want to call it. Um, and we just, I can be friends with these people because we just kind of think the same and we have the same core. Now you can say, I have something here. Now let me discover what they are and put words to it. But you can't sit alone and say, oh, I want them to be A, B, C, and D because they're not going to be real. That's so great. Thank you for that, Todd. And thank you for taking the time to chat with me today. I know how busy you are. So it just means the world to me. Well, we I love what you guys are doing and what you and your partners have done have have helped me for decades. And so (laughs) I love to be able to to share and give back and and also hopefully other people that you are touching can leverage what you guys have created um, and do great things for great people all over the place. Thanks, Todd. And to all the amazing entrepreneurs listening today, as always, I greatly appreciate you spending time with us and I wish you all much love and gratitude. 